Hi, I'm Chris Blanford. I'm a member of faculty here at the University of Manchester School of Materials. My research group is based here at the Manchester Institute of Biotechnology. One of the goals of my group's research is to create miniature power sources that work on common fuels like alcohols. That's the point of my talk today, talking to you about enzymatic biofuel cells. The goals of this talk are to introduce you to the concept of a fuel cell, describe a few of the key components of a conventional polymer electrolyte membrane, or PEM fuel cell, contrast a PEM fuel cell with an enzymatic fuel cell, and describe the problems and promise of their widespread use. So, by the end of the talk, you should understand how a PEM fuel cell works, understand how an enzymatic biofuel cell differs from a conventional PEM fuel cell, and be able to describe the pros and cons of biofuel cells. A fuel cell is a device that converts chemical energy directly into electrical energy. The chemical energy comes from a fuel, such as hydrogen, hydrocarbons, or alcohols, and an oxidant, which is frequently oxygen from air. Fuel cells have been around since the middle of the 19th century. This drawing shows an original fuel cell. In 1843, William Grove showed that hydrogen and oxygen could combine to produce electricity and water. More advanced fuel cells were used to provide power on the Gemini and Apollo space missions. This test unit for the Gemini missions produced one kilowatt of electrical power, about half as much as a typical electrical kettle consumes. The unit is over 60 centimeters across. The overall chemical reaction for a fuel cell looks like combustion. So for a hydrogen-oxygen fuel cell, hydrogen and oxygen are fed in, almost always through separate inlets. The device generates electrical power. So far, just like combustion, with hydrogen being completely oxidized to water. But you have to look inside to see what makes fuel cells different. On the hydrogen side, the H2 molecule gets broken apart into H plus ions, also called protons and electrons. The side where the oxidation takes place is called the anode. The electrons go one path and provide electrical power, and the protons move along the inside of the fuel cell. The electrons and protons combine on the oxygen side to make water. The side where the reduction takes place is known as the cathode. Adding the two half reactions together gives you the same combustion reaction, but one that runs at much lower temperatures, typically below 120 degrees C. Essentially, this is electrolytic water splitting run in reverse. The two half reactions go too slowly to be useful unless a catalyst is present to speed them up. The most common catalyst on both the anode and the cathode is platinum. This means that if hydrogen and oxygen mix together, they will catch fire within a fuel cell. To prevent this from happening, a membrane is used to separate the two halves. After the, precious metal fuel, after the precious metal catalyst, the proton exchange membrane, or PEM, is the most expensive component of the fuel cell. Other low temperature fuel cells work in the same way. The overall reaction for a direct methanol fuel cell, for example, shows a complete combustion of methanol to carbon dioxide and water. In this case, the reaction at the anode is the breakdown of water and methanol into carbon dioxide, protons, and electrons. The reaction at the cathode is again the reduction of oxygen to water. So why would you use a fuel cell? For a start, there's energy efficiency. Compare fuel cell power generation to how electricity is conventionally generated, by burning fuel in air. The heat is used to heat water, which drives turbines to generate electricity. Theoretically, about two-thirds of the energy in the fuel could be converted into electrical power. However, the average efficiency of electricity combustion from coal, petroleum, and gas-fired plants was around 30 to 40 percent in 2013. This means that 60 to 70 percent of the energy stored in chemical bonds is thrown away rather than providing power. Hydrogen-oxygen fuel cells, on the other hand, currently have working efficiencies of 40 to 60 percent. Fuel cells also have fewer moving parts, so tend to be quieter and have lower maintenance costs. The reactions run at lower temperatures and so are well suited to consumer devices. Liquid fuels also have a higher energy density than batteries, meaning that you're able to get more power from the same volume or mass of batteries. Plus, fuel cells keep working as long as there's fuel and oxygen around. No need to recharge. This is great for reliable, portable power generations. 
The downsides start with the cost, both capital and running costs. The cost of power for hydrogen fuel cells is about 100 times higher than conventionally generated electricity. The precious metal catalysts and the polymer electrolyte membrane are the two biggest capital costs. Hydrogen is difficult to transport and handle, which adds to the running cost. The use of precious metal catalysts like platinum in fuel cells also introduces price volatility and supply issues. The price of platinum since 2000 has ranged from under $15 per gram to over $60 per gram. A large-scale fuel cell requires about half a gram to about a gram of platinum per kilowatt of power. The platinum catalyzes reduction and oxidation best at extreme pH values, so PEM fuel cells typically run in very acidic or alkaline environments, limiting the selection of materials that won't corrode. On top of that, fuel cell lifetimes are typically a few thousand hours, about half of what's required for applications and an order magnitude lower than what's needed for stationary power generation. Typically, rechargeable lithium batteries have at least a fuel cell's lifetime. Finally, while efficient, electri efficient electricity generation that creates only water is appealing, the vast majority of hydrogen and most methanol is produced from hydrocarbons, so the process isn't that low in carbon as it appears on the surface. The plus side is that enzymatic fuel cells tackle the first three of these disadvantages. Those three disadvantages all stem from the requirements of the catalysts. Enzymes are biological catalysts, and some of them catalyze the same reactions as the inorganic catalysts in fuel cells. We call these enzyme-based devices biofuel cells because they use biochemical machinery, not because they only run on biofuels. In an, en in an enzymatic biofuel cell, enzymes replace the inorganic catalyst on either the anode or the cathode or both. These enzymes use earth-abundant elements like copper, nickel, and iron to speed up the fuel cell reactions. For example, this cartoon representation of a multi-copper oxidase is called bilirubin oxidase. The actual enzyme is about six nanometers across. It has four copper ions in it, a cluster of three coppers buried in the center, and a single copper near the surface. These coppers are charged up by four electrons from the electrode. Oxygen binds at the trinuclear cluster, and water is given off. This is the same electrochemical half-reaction that was shown in the fuel cell reaction slide. Many of these copper enzymes are even more efficient than platinum at reducing oxygen to water, meaning that you get a higher maximum voltage output than an enzymatic fuel cell than in a conventional one. Enzymes often selectively react with small range of substrates. For example, hydrogen and methanol do not have a large effect on the catalytic performance of bilirubin oxidase. In a fuel cell that uses enzymes on both the anode and the cathode, this means that there's no need for a polymer electrolyte membrane. Hybrid enzymatic fuel cells, in which only the anode or the cathode is coated with enzymes, usually still require a PEM. Finally, the enzymes work at a physiological pH value, opening up the construction of fuel cell assemblies to a wider range of materials. So, by substituting enzymes for inorganic catalysts, we've removed several economic barriers to fuel cell adoption. There are numerous enzymes being researched for use in biofuel cells. On the previous slide, I mentioned multi-copper oxidases, including lacases and bilirubin oxidases. To oxidize fuel, examples include hydrogenases, hydrogenases which interconvert hydrogen and protons, alcohol dehydrogenases for alcohols like methanol and ethanol, and glucose oxidase for glucose and, to a lesser, cent, lesser extent, some other six carbon sugars. Fuels that are more chemically complex than hydrogen require a cocktail or a cascade of enzymes to fully oxidize the fuel and maximize the extraction of energy. Enzymatic biofuel cells are currently in a laboratory stage only, but there have been some promising proofs of concept. For example, a cell based on glucose oxidase and a multi-copper oxidase has been used to generate power when implanted in biological systems, for example, consuming the sugar produced by plant photosynthesis. Right now, however, the power output from enzymatic biofuel cells is much lower than conventional fuel cells. Even fuel cells made with the best enzyme electrodes, which have enzymes in electron transporting polymers or on high surface area supports, like the one shown here with these vertically aligned carbon nanotube arrays, still produce an order of magnitude lower current and power than platinum-based fuel cells. 
Part of the problem is that enzymes are much larger than catalytically active sites on metals. There's a lot more active surface area for the reactions on the metals than conventional fuel cells. Catalyst lifetime is an even more of an issue for enzymatic fuel cells than for conventional ones. The enzyme's function depends on them maintaining their structure and any cofactors like metal ions. Extreme temperatures or pH values or the presence of inhibitors can quickly and irreversibly damage the enzymes and lower fuel cell performance. Enzymes can be protected for many of these effects by encapsulation or surface modification and have been shown to work for months. Related to the lifetime is the thermal stability of the enzymes. Enzymatic reactions go faster with higher temperatures until they denature. Faster reactions mean more electrical current and power, so it's advantageous to run the fuel cells at a higher te as high a temperature as possible. Finally, even though enzymes can be produced on an industrial scale, the cost of enzymes is still higher than platinum when normalized by their catalytic ability. Some of these costs can be lowered by economies of scale, but it's likely that enzymatic biofuel cells will be economical only in niche applications like remote environmental sensors or implantable electronics, rather than in large-scale power generation.